Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, welcome to the FATF's uh, webinar on money laundering and the illegal wildlife trade. My name is Daniel Tereskloff. I'm the outgoing co-chair of the Risk, Trends and Methods Working Group, the working group that has been responsible for conducting, among others, also this part of the work over the last year. This would not have been possible without the leadership of the People's Republic of China. This is why, before introducing the agenda, I now have the pleasure to pass on the floor to the head of the Chinese delegation to the FATF, Mr. Mingyu Bao. Please, Mr. Bao, the floor is yours. Good evening from Beijing. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the former FATF president, Mr. Liu Xiaomin, I would like to thank you for participating in this forum to discuss the findings of the FATF report on money laundering and the illegal wildlife trade. This is the first time the FATF has completed work to understand and map out the money laundering risks related to the illegal wildlife trade and offered a series of proposed measures to help governments and the private sector respond to these risks. The FATF's report shows that the illegal wildlife trade is a major transnational organized crime, which generates billions of euros and dollars in criminal proceeds each year. The illegal wildlife trade fuels corruption, threatens biodiversity, and it can have a significant negative impact on public health and the economy. Wildlife criminals exploit weaknesses in the financial and non-financial sectors to move, hide, and launder their proceeds, enabling further crimes and damaging financial integrity. Despite this, jurisdictions rarely investigate the financial trail left by this crime. Efforts to combat the financial side of the illegal wildlife trade have so far failed to deal with the scale and nature of this crime. The FATF as the global standard setter in the fight against money laundering and terrorist financing is seriously concerned about the lack of focus on the financial aspects of the illegal wildlife trade. The Chinese presidency initiated this priority project to support jurisdictions to more effectively follow and disrupt the financial flows involved in the illegal wildlife trade. With the aim of de deterring this lucrative criminal activity. While the FATF's work generally enhances our understanding of the financial flows linked to the illegal wildlife trade and brings much needed attention to this, is, to this issue. It is what happens next that matters most. It is vital that the jurisdictions take actions to respond to the findings of this report. For both the public and private sectors, there's a need to review the financial risks posed by wildlife traffickers and to ensure that domestic legislation, law enforcement agencies, and private sector internal controls allow for effective financial response to this issue. Take China, for example. This year, China is revising the criminal law to strengthen the sanctions on environmental crime and money laundering crime. The Customs is carrying out a special action to combat wildlife smuggling and strengthening cooperation with anti-money laundering agencies and overseas law enforcement agencies. The FIU and some financial institutions have explored targeted model to identify STRs linked to the illegal wildlife trade with successful detected cases. And the People's Bank of China, as the AML and safety regulator, also improved the guidance and training on regulated institutions to encourage them to stay vigilant against suspicious activities related to the illegal wildlife trade. So ladies and gentlemen, 
it is really a great pleasure to open this FATA forum as it presents a unique opportunity to discuss the implementation of practical next steps and actions to combat the illegal wildlife trade. All of our speakers bring valuable experience on money laundering and the illegal wildlife trade. And I hope that with their insights and the further reflections from the floor, we will today be able to secure further commitments from both the public and private sectors for further actions. With this, I would like to hand the floor over to our moderator for today, Mr. Daniel Talis Kalaf, to introduce the eighth agenda and our speakers. Daniel has extensive experience in the fight against the money laundering and terrorist financing and has held various senior positions, including the head of Switzerland's Financial Intelligence Unit, chair of the FATF Group on Risks, Methods and Trends, and chair of the Council of Europe's Anti-Money Laundering Committee. I thank you very much for your attention. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bao, not only for your um, introduction, but also for the leadership that uh, China has shown over the last year during its uh, presidency over the, the FATF and the, the great result we have achieved, not only, but also with this, with this report. Now, I, I do hope that most of you had actually the chance uh, to, to read the report and familiarize yourself with the content. The objective of the uh, webinar today is, is actually to discuss with you um, the, the implications of the report, and in particular how governments, private sector, civil society, and others um, can take the next steps, because this is what, what matters now, as, as Mr. Bao said, uh, said correctly. Um, so the main focus on the webinar will be how, we, how do we follow up on the recommendations made, and whether we will hear, uh, and I'm sure we will hear, commitments to do, conduct further work. Um, for that reason, we have split the webinar into three parts, three sessions, all of them equipped with uh, fantastic experienced uh, um, uh, presenters and speakers. Uh, we will first, in the first session, we will speak about the uh, money laundering trends linked, associated with the illegal wildlife trade. Uh, we will then, in the second session, hear about innovative actions, both from public and the private sector. To, to tackle money laundering associated to illegal wildlife trade. Um, and in the third session, we will uh, talk about the next steps and commitment for action. Um, if time allows, and I very much hope so, that time will allow it, uh, we will then open the floor to participants of the webinar, to you, uh, to come up with questions. I hope we will be able to at least address uh, a number of these questions. Um, Yes, you can participate in that uh, in that webinar by using uh, the Q and A um, question and answer functionality in Zoom, which we'll see at the bottom on the right side. Uh, the secretariat will uh, monitor the questions that are coming in, and at the end um, of each session, at the end of the webinar, we will be hopefully be able to um, answer as many as. A question as, as possible. Do not use the raise your hand function. You may be used to that in other Zoom webinars. Um, given the large number of the participants, we are over uh, 600 already now, uh, we have chosen to use the Q&A um, function. I will introduce the participants, uh, participants the panelists of, of each session um, while we uh, move through, through the sessions. Um, please note also that the FATF is recording this webinar. Uh, it will be um, uh, put on the FATF website, so it will be uh, made available uh, publicly. Um, the FATF will also use other social media platforms to disseminate the results of, um, of this webinar. Again, if time allows, at the end, we will try to uh, put a few questions in front of you to use the polling function of, uh, of this tool. Um, and please, uh, I hope that as many as possible of you can participate. Uh, this will help us also to feel the pulse. So with that, um, we will now start with the first session um, where we ask the question, what does money laundering from uh, illegal uh, wildlife trade uh, look like? We have uh, prepared 15 minutes. We have uh, two speakers, you see uh, both names now on the screen. 
Um, the purpose of, the section, of this session is really to highlight the main money laundering techniques uh, and payment mechanisms that have been detected that are being used to uh, by criminal groups that are engaged in IWT. Uh, we will want to understand the picture and we hope that understanding this picture will uh, help to frame then the later discussions in sessions uh, two and three uh, where we, when we discuss how to uh, respond to the challenge. Um, we'll start with Martin Wired. Martin is not only the head of the AML CFD Capacity Building Unit within UK Treasury, he's also one of the three co-leads of the FATF report uh, that uh, the FATF has published uh, a few weeks ago. Um, he will be followed by Nick Ehlers. Nick is a senior global expert at uh, traffic, um, and he will be speaking shortly about the forthcoming report by traffic and UNODC uh, on key payment mechanisms. But let's start with uh, Martin. Uh, Martin, please, the floor is yours for your first intervention. Thank you, Daniel, and hi, everyone. Uh, as Daniel said, I'm going to speak about some of the money laundering and payment techniques that we identified in the FATF project. Now, we think that this was one of the more unique aspects of the report, and I think it's worth your attention today. So I'll start with who is laundering IWT proceeds and then where they're laundered before moving to how indeed those proceeds are laundered. I'll end, it, I'll end with some, some thoughts on what this means for this audience. So in terms of who, the FATF report primarily focused on large-scale transnational trafficking groups. We reviewed over 50 cases, and many of those involved millions of dollars of proceeds. Our key finding was that there appears to be an absence of professional launderers. Unlike other predicate offenses like drug trafficking, we found that it was rare to see the involvement of third parties who are not connected to the underlying criminality. Instead, IWT syndicates are often using existing members of their groups to launder their proceeds rather than outsourcing that activity. This consolidation of roles presents opportunities for law enforcement, both because there are fewer actors involved and because the laundering is likely to be less sophisticated. Now moving to where the laundering is taking place, this is happening across source, transit and destination countries. As you would expect, the majority of proceeds are typically ending up in the country where the syndicate leaders are based. This is usually the destination country where consumers are buying the product, or indeed those that neighbor it within the region. Syndicates are also reinvesting those proceeds back into source countries to cover the ongoing costs of criminal activity, for instance, on things like shipping costs for vehicles and other sort of business costs. However, what is perhaps more interesting is that many IWT groups and syndicates appear to be regularly diverting and concealing the proceeds from IWT in other countries too. Countries which aren't part of the physical trade route for the traffic product. That means that for many products and groups, there are indeed two distinct routes, one for the money and one for the product. So it's not just the source, transit, and destination countries that need to be vigilant towards IWT. What this FATF report really highlights is that a much wider range of countries need to be alert to this threat and follow both routes for the products and the money. That means even those parts of the world which we do not typically associate with the illegal wildlife trade, Europe, for instance. The multiple glass eel cases in the report show that a number of European countries are home to wildlife trafficking. And if they take anything from this report, it's that um, they should make sure that they have the right defenses in place and understand their IWT risks fully, both from a conservation and a financial crime perspective. Now moving to how IWT syndicates launder their proceeds. Well, what we found in the report is that criminals are using a wide range of methods across the supply chain to move and launder them. I want to focus now on three key money laundering themes that emerged. First is the important role of front and shell companies. Starting with front companies, the report finds that in many cases, um, front companies had links to the legal wildlife trade, such as farms, breeding facilities, and zoos, including tiger zoos, which get a mention in the report. 
A case in the report provided by the NGO Liberty Shared also shows that this can include companies that are not indeed related to wildlife. In this example, a large ivory trafficking outfit had set up a tea trading company in Kenya to conceal both the movement of the actual ivory and the money that they made from this trade. Moving now to shell companies, as I mentioned earlier, we found that many IWT syndicates are often taking advantage of weak regulatory uh, environments in jurisdictions with poor AML controls. Like other transnational criminal groups, what they're doing is exploiting some of those uh, financial and company formation centers to set up complex company structures, which means multiple layers of ownership across multiple jurisdictions which all in all makes it much harder for law enforcement to identify who the real beneficial owners are and trace the connected assets back to the source. Secondly, in terms of money laundering trends, it appears that, that cash is indeed still king. And what we found is that, that cash remains central to, the, to IWT, particularly within source countries with larger informal economies. Now, of course, cash does present ongoing challenges for detection and, and for law enforcement and private sector as well. But we found that criminals are in fact layering and integrating the cash through the formal financial sector, often in, in flagrant ways uh, and other um, regulated businesses. Now, this includes doing that through the purchase of high value goods like jewelry and cars and through prepaid cards. It includes through cash deposits disguised as loans. And finally, it also includes third party wire transfers through banks that are connected into the international network. Thirdly, and finally on money laundering trends, I want to discuss the growing use of what the fat of standards call new technologies. So virtual assets and online payment platforms to launder IWT proceeds. The rapidly developing and expanding payment infrastructure for online sales pose real challenges to efforts to tackle the illegal wildlife trade. We saw that mobile payment platforms are being misused, as are mobile apps or social media-based platforms that are linked to bank accounts. It's crucial, uh, we hope that this report makes it very clear that um, it's crucial for authorities to understand the risks that these technologies um, represent, as well as the opportunities, of course, for financial inclusion. So, Finally, and, and to wrap this all up, wh what does this all mean? Well, the conclusion here for us is that clearly the, the money laundering picture is buried. The methods used by IWT groups to launder their gains change depending on which region is involved, the product being trafficked, and the quantum of proceeds. That means there is no one-size-fits-all approach to tackling IWT as a financial crime. But more positively, I would like to end by saying that none of the money laundering techniques that we observed in this report uh, will be new to AML CFT agencies and can all be addressed with a comprehensive implementation of the FATF standards. The FATF has now given countries the rules and the tools to tackle money laundering associated with IWT. Now, those countries need the political will and the right resources in the right place to meet that challenge and help end the illegal wildlife trade. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, you highlight a lot of points. We'll, we'll get back to, to some of them later on in the Q&A session, but let me now move on directly to, uh, to Nick. Um, it was important in, in, the, in the work we have done to include uh, civil society from the outset, uh, uh, also because a lot of civil society organizations and, and traffic being uh, one of one of the major ones have done uh, considerable work already uh, on this area, including on the financing and the money laundering aspect. So with that, Nick, um, I'll pass the floor to you. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, and thanks to the Financial Action Task Force for inviting me to be a part of this this webinar. Uh, as mentioned, I work for Traffic, um, based in South Africa, and uh, since the mid-1970s, Traffic has worked with a wide range of public and private partners to ensure that the trade in wild plants and animals is not a threat to conservation. But over the last seven and a half years, I've been managing a global illegal wildlife trafficking initiative funded by USAID called the Wildlife Traps Project. Um, and in the interest of time, I encourage you to go to our website, traffic.org, to get more information on that project and, and likewise what traffic is doing more globally. 
But one of the areas of focus that I've had for traffic is to invest in initiatives within the financial sector and specialized law enforcement to build momentum and recognition of illegal wildlife trade as a financial crime. And through the Wildlife Traps project in particular, we provided initial resources um, a few years ago now to bring together an expert group of financial sector partners to brainstorm ways to improve information flow and coordination within the sector um, around this issue. Uh, and this has led to what is now the United for Wildlife Financial Task Force, which we'll hear more about later in the webinar by, by colleagues. Um, and I've also been a part of a range of training with financial intelligence units and asset recovery units over the years, uh, working alongside many of the partners present today. Um, but over the years, I can say the biggest ask to traffic from both the financial institutions as well as law enforcement is essentially the same. Um, because up until now, there's really been a lack of precedent for using financial investigation in relation to wildlife crime cases, there's subsequently fewer typologies available to illuminate how the flows of money associated with the trade work. So reports like the recently launched FATF report are critical because they fill those knowledge gaps uh, and direct practitioners in the right direction. Uh, and similarly, as mentioned, Traffic's been working with um, UNODC and many other contributing partners, NGOs, FIUs, and other experts to compile a series of cases where financial investigation has been used, either partially or in full, to develop a report that presents the financial data um, and other case information to highlight trends and patterns, as well as recommendations for partners. So this report is currently being finalized and will be published soon. But wanted to take an opportunity to highlight some of the key findings, uh, which pleasantly, <laughs> fortunately, are very complementary to the findings of the report, uh, thought of report, which Martin just outlined. Uh, but we were very pleased after canvassing the globe uh, with the range of partners we worked with that the cases we received and are included in the report uh, represent a great cross section of geographic regions as well as a range of terrestrial and marine species as well. And as one can imagine uh, from any work in other illicit commodity types such as drugs or counterfeit goods, et cetera, the flow of funding to evade detection is as diverse as the means uh, to move the physical product, as Martin also highlighted just now. And the cases in, the, in our report illustrate a wide range of payment types, as, as was also mentioned, from domestic to international wire transfers, trade-based money laundering, uh, mobile money platforms as well, use of money transfer service companies, uh, prepaid vouchers uh, played a significant role, Hawala, um, nominee accounts and shell companies, legitimate businesses, as well as uh, a high use of cash intensive businesses, as you can imagine. Uh, the report also includes information on red flag indicators, um, corruption and vulnerabilities, uh, lists of associated high risk entities, um, and data on convergence between wildlife and other crimes. So once it's released, we really look forward to hearing uh, from you all uh, how useful it is, because um, certainly our intention is to be as responsive as we can to the needs of, of the sector. So having collaborated in its development with that of to ensure that our reports are, are complementary, I'm sure we can agree, um, as Martin and others co-authors, uh, that the process reveals just how little information is documented regarding the financial flows associated with wildlife crime. Um, but we're making a tremendous uh, effort in, in, in changing that. And despite the fact that I feel we're really just scratching the surface of the potential impact approaching illegal wildlife trade as a financial crime, uh, it's incredibly encouraging uh, watching this area continue to grow and gain momentum. As one clear example of this is FATF itself recognizing wildlife crime as a priority during this last presidency. So efforts like this really do make a difference. Um, and we cannot forget collectively that wildlife crime is a for-profit crime and therefore requires the financial crime response alongside all the other great efforts by partners to disrupt these illicit businesses. So I will leave it there, but happy to answer any questions, of course. Um, and uh, thanks again for, for the opportunity to be a part of this. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Nick, I think we should thank you to, to participate in, in our efforts. Um, I think you both uh, highlighted the, the main elements of, of your report, also that they do fill a gap that has existed. 
it's also interesting to to hear from from Martin that the, the laundering part isn't isn't rocket science. It's pretty straightforward. It's not uh, it, it's not done by professional money launderers. It's by the criminal organisation itself. But also important to hear that this is not just a problem for source and destination and maybe some transit countries. It's, a, it's an issue for everyone. Um, and I think that should remind us of, of our responsibilities we have here. Um, um, and certainly important to say that IW2 is a financial crime and there's a role to play by the private sector. And I was very glad to hear um, um, uh, the way we worked in Pada on that, but also how, how you guys at traffic work for that is, is a true element and another good example of a, of a private-public partnership. And I think we'll get back to that uh, in, in the next sessions too. So thank you both for um, Nick and, and Martin for setting the stage. Um, I know there are questions coming up and it's good that the participants use the, the Q&A functionality, but um, uh, a little bit um, mindful of time. So we'll get back to that at the end of the session and you will both be, be available until, until the end. Um, which brings us to the to the second part of the, the webinar, uh, which where we're asking the question: What are what can countries do? What can financial institutions do? What can civil society do to uh, help combat uh, money laundering from IWT? Um, so uh, the purpose of the section is here to showcase a few uh, a few good examples uh, and show also innovative approaches. Um, I will start with, uh, with Tarant uh, Moktagong, who's a senior prosecutor uh, in Botswana, also one of the co-leads along with Young and, and, and with Martin, followed by Marcy Foreman. Marcy uh, has a senior function at the AML Global Investigations Unit of, of City. And then last but not least, uh, we'll hear uh, Fabrizio Fioroni, uh, who is uh, from Vietnam, covering the Southeast Asia region as a regional advisor for UNODC. Uh, Tyron, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, let me also thank uh, Martin and, uh, and, and Nick. Uh, the presentations that we just had uh, from Martin and Nick confirmed that the proceeds generated by IWT are a global threat rather than just a problem for source, transit, and destination countries. The FATF report highlights the importance of understanding the financial threats and risk from wildlife traffickers as a first step. This applies to governments as well as the private sector, which is why the report highlights the role that national risk assessments can play. Another key step is for governments to ensure that their national legislation allows for a financial response to IWT, including by ensuring that information exchange mechanisms are in place and financial investigations can be carried out. This calls for both a high level political commitment and enhanced operational coordination between law enforcement agencies responsible for wildlife crime and those working on anti-money laundering. I wish to highlight two innovative examples from the FATF report undertaken by the public and private sector to tackle money laundering from IWT. The first, which can be found at box 17 of the report, is really industrious as opposed to innovative. It was provided by Australia and ticks a lot of the boxes of good practices highlighted in the report. The authorities initiated parallel financial investigations early in the process and engage several agencies within the jurisdiction, amongst them the FIU and wildlife authorities. The case began through an interception of international mail, attempting to smuggle illegal wildlife out of the country. The financial information available from the several agencies enabled the FIU to identify additional actors in two other countries. The case is reflective of the transnational element of IWT and demonstrates how effective international cooperation can overcome the challenges of investigating an organized group spread across several continents. Lastly, the case has a beautiful ending. Not only was the criminal convicted of money laundering amongst other offenses, his dirty assets were confiscated and two Burmese pythons were recovered, demonstrating how effective investigation can also be a conservation tool. The second example 
found at box 33 of the FATF report, describes an initiative between civil society and financial institutions to exchange ongoing information on financial threats and trends from either Wuchi. This includes information on open source data, on wildlife crime offenders, and changes in either Wuchi markets. This information assists in increasing resilience in the financial sector by strengthening risk awareness and controls. It is also a good example of how the transnational nature of the illegal wildlife trade requires targeted and strategic information sharing across the private and public sectors. Lastly, let me conclude by saying that these examples are very different, but they both show that concerted effort, whether it's industrious or innovative, and a focus on the financial aspects are key ingredients in the fight against IWT. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tyron. Um, so for giving this, this few good examples where things have worked the way we want them to work. Um, and I'll pass on um, the floor to, to, to Marcy Foreman. As I mentioned, partnership with financial institutions is important. And a few institutions, including City and others, have taken the lead on that. This is not a completely new topic to you. I'm very curious to hear uh, on uh, anti-money laundering measures that a bank, uh, a financial institution, can take. Marcy, the floor is yours. Yes. Hello. Thank you. As we approach October and our two-year anniversary of the formation of the United for Wildlife Task Force, our members report great progress in embedding IWT into their financial crime progress. Given the scarcity of information around IWT as a financial crime prior to the publication of the FATF report, our members have been hungry for specific information so they can develop and implement IWT indicators in transaction monitoring and in their various investigative processes. There are various red flag indicators that financial institutions can consider when reviewing activity to see if it's indicative of illegal wildlife trafficking. Individually, these red flag indicators may be indicative of normal trade activity, but when considered collectively and along with other transactional red flags, they can be an indicator of illicit wildlife activity. One way in which financial institutions can focus their efforts in addressing this typology is by establishing what we refer to as trusted relationships, where permissible, information sharing with law enforcement and non NGOs that allow for real time information sharing pursuant to the applicable laws of that jurisdiction. Once that information is received, the financial institution is able to see if there are any direct touch points or if there are any indirect touch points such as through foreign correspondent bank relationships. This allows the financial institution to review transactional activity through either the direct client accounts or through foreign correspondent bank, or as we know, FCB networks. That may be indicative of legal wildlife trade. This is where the benefit of the United for Wildlife Task Force is clear. Enhanced information sharing with trusted partners who are members of this task force. In addition to forming trusted relationships, financial institutions may view open source information and negative news to identify any individuals or entities who are alleged to be connected to the illegal wildlife trade and conduct internal searches within their own financial institution on those names to determine if there are any touch points to their institution. Many financial institutions, including Citibank, conduct negative news searches and have initiated investigations related to seizures of elephant ivory and arrest of wildlife traffickers based on these reviews. Additional illustrations of innovative and impactful approaches from United Wildlife Task Force members in combating this evil has been shared with me by David Fine, the co-chair of UWT, and I'd like to share them with you. One member who is an international money transfer business assisted with other strategic partners in the financial investigation of a criminal group operating across five countries. An internal transactional review led to important findings and reporting and ultimately arrest of a number of individuals and seizures of thousands of Pangolian scales, which were concealed inside pieces of timber. A member headquartered in Africa identified the following two potential anticipated impacts related to COVID-19 on IWT and took a deeper dive. 
Increased tra what was identified was increased trafficking close to game parks, increased susceptibility to bribery among wildlife rangers, law enforcement, and municipal workers. They conducted a tar targeted analysis focusing on different red flags, indicators that produce a group of high-risk customers and a small number of transactions potentially related to IWT. These red flag indicators include cash intensive activity in accounts of customers based in close proximity to these parks and irregular credits into the accounts of employees of the national park. Again, those are indicators that are outside what you would normally see in these accounts. A report on this work during a webinar led to one of the non-government organization partners to reaching out to the bank to share information on ivory trade. This led to further investigation and ultimately to multiple suspicious activity reports known as STRs and SARS filed with the relevant authorities. In China, new regulations were introduced, including bans on the trading and transportation of wildlife for consumption, as well as redaction of all wildlife, hunting licenses, and a clear ban on capturing nets, hunting sets, night hunting, lights, and electronic trapping devices. A member headquartered in China used their AML teams to introduce these new regulations into their transaction monitoring systems. They were able to identify mixed legal and illegal income in relation to wildlife breeding boxes and transport cages. In conclusion, the range of approaches I have showcased reflect the diverse ways in which criminal, criminals will traffic wildlife and launder their proceeds through financial institutions. Key takeaway is that financial institutions need to really understand IWT in the ju jurisdictions in which they operate. And it is this detailed risk understanding that underpins effective targeted responses that can support law enforcement agencies to bring IWT criminals to justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcy, not only for sharing a, a practical example of how, how you conduct things, but also, again, remind us of, you know, one, the importance of a comprehensive and targeted risk assessment and understanding, both, I believe, on government side and, and in, in the private sector, but also the need to collaborate um, uh, and the need to share information. I think it's another, inf uh, another example how, how important it is that uh, public to uh, private, but also private to private information sharing can be used to achieve um, the results we want to see. Without further ado, I, I now pass on uh, the floor to Fabrizio Fironi from uh, UNODC, who will speak about uh, cooperation between countries in Southeast Asia. Please, Fabrizio. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thanks to FATF and the project team for organizing this webinar. And thanks to participants for attending. UNODC, as the guardian of the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and the United Nations Convention against corruption works closely with UN member countries through different programs at national, regional, and global levels. These programs address money laundering, financing of terrorism, corruption, wildlife, and forestry crimes, just to name a few. For money laundering from illegal wildlife trade, UNODC in Southeast Asia, for example, has been providing technical assistance and capacity building in support to our member countries for enhancing skills in FIUs, investigative agencies, and prosecutors' offices, with the aim to increase the use of financial intelligence and the effectiveness of financial investigations when pursuing uh, illegal wildlife trade cases. At the same time, UNODC has been also engaging with other regional and global partners, such as FATF, FATF-style regional bodies, and Interpol, for example, as well as with the private sector and civil society to strengthen the partnership with public authorities. More recently, UNODC has also supported countries in making relevant contributions to the FADF's money laundering and illegal wildlife trade report. Throughout uh, this process, it was noted that there, there were cases, case studies involving transnational organized crime networks for which the relevant investigations had been confined only within uh, the national borders and no international cooperation was pursued at any stage of the criminal investigation. Such case studies did result in the arrests and conviction of some perpetrators and in the seizures of illegal wildlife products and few assets. 
However, uh, following the discussions with the relevant authorities, it was understood that the suspects believed to be the kingpins of the criminal networks were not really touched by the investigations because their possible ill-gotten proceeds had been laundered through complex international trade operations against which investigative steps were not taken. Thus, there was not enough evidence regarding the illegal origin of the proceeds. And in fact, there were indications that the same kingpins might have continued the illegal activities even after the conclusion of the investigations, and that significant amounts of money from IWT had been laundered without being detected. After due consideration of the outcomes of the FATF money laundering IWT report and the already available financial intelligence together with information from previous investigations, such countries evaluated that those cold cases needed to be developed further through international cooperation with other countries in order to go after the kingpins and their illegal assets. Therefore, by making use of the networks established between UNODC and the UN member countries for the implementation of those programs uh, that I mentioned before, UNODC has also supported those countries in establishing contacts with the relevant agencies abroad. And the result is that uh, the informal exchange of financial intelligence is already at an advanced level. This is just um, an example on how the work of organizations like FADF and UNODC can help member countries in tackling transnational organized crime networks responsible for money laundering from illegal wildlife trade in a practical way. This example also shows that countries should make it a priority the use of international cooperation when dealing with transnational money laundering from illegal wildlife trade together with the, recommendation, the recommended actions which are, uh, have been provided with the FATF anti-money laundering and illegal wildlife trade report. I will be happy to uh, answer any further questions that uh, might relate to, to UNODC support to our member countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Fabrizio. Um, you, you highlighted the um, the importance of financial intelligence, the, the role of financial intelligence units in, in particular, um, but also um, the, the need to work cross borders. There is a, clearly a, a cross border risk, uh, apparently. Uh, the criminals do work uh, cross borders, they ignore borders very often. Um, so the response can also can only be one where, where countries uh, collaborate. Um, and um, this explains why uh, the role also of UNODC is so important to, to enable that cooperation. Um, but indeed, it is, um, at the end of the day, it's, um, it's a responsibility of countries to actually do that work. You can help them, uh, and so can we. But at the end of the day, it is people and countries who have to form these networks to uh, address the challenge that criminals do, unfortunately, very effectively uh, use networks to, to commit the crime. Um, with that, um, I think we move on to the, to the next part, because the next part is uh, what we are particularly um, interested in is, uh, is the next steps, and, uh, and also hear from partners and participants in that, in that webinar on, on what their ideas are to take action um, after the publication of the, of the FATF, report, FATF report. So in session three, um, we will again have a number of um, distinguished panelists, um, but before I will um, introduce them um, uh, and give them the floor, um, we will hear um, a short video message from the current FATF president. I'm using the opportunities to, to congratulate Marcus for taking over this important function. He's the, the first um, FATF president that has a two-year term. Um, I kindly ask the Secretariat to now um, show us the video with the, the message from, from Marcus Plyer. Hi everyone. Thank you everyone for participating in this FATF webinar. My name is Marcus Plyer and I took the position of FATF president on 1st of July this year. The FATF report on the illegal wildlife trade marks a vital moment in the fight against wildlife crime. It lays out a clear path that national authorities can take to effectively investigate and prosecute the people 
involved in the wildlife trade and the laundering of the proceeds thereof, including organized crime gangs. Removing the profits will take away the key driver behind this crime and ultimately help protect our precious biodiversity and win the fight against this crime. Sadly, our environment faces many other threats, including from highly lucrative environmental crimes such as illegal logging, illegal land clearing, or unlawful waste disposal. Therefore, under the German presidency, the Fatah will expand its focus to include these environmental crimes. The growth rate of environmental crimes is astonishing. Interpol and the UN environmental program now estimate that natural resources worth up to $259 billion are being stolen by criminals each year. Environmental crime also undermines peace and results in sustainability issues, robbing future generations of wealth, health, and well-being on a huge scale. Under my presidency, the FATF plans to help prosecutors and financial investigation units identify environmental crimes to ensure this threat is not ignored. I thank you again for attending this webinar and urge you to prioritize the fight against the illegal wildlife trade and environmental crime by going after the money that fuels these criminal acts. Okay, this was the, uh, the message from the top uh, and you can clearly hear that the FATF will continue to be committed on, on tackling um, environmental crimes, including um, IWT. I now have the pleasure to introduce the four panelists of this last session. Um, we'll start with Scott Rembrandt, um, certainly very well known to our US colleagues. He's the head of the US delegation to FADAF and Deputy Assistant Secretary of the US Treasury. Um, we will then hear Melissa Tellis, who's a program management officer at um, UNODC office speaking particularly about the money laundering um, aspects um, or counter money laundering aspects of the work of UNODC. Um, David Fine has already been mentioned by uh, uh, by previous speaker from, from City. Uh, he's uh, Group General Counsel of Standard Charter and he's also the co-chair of the United for Wildlife Financial Task Force that has been mentioned before. And last but not least, um, we will hear from a representative of an FATF regional body, um, in this case from the Eastern and South African uh, Money Laundering Group, uh, SM Black, um, uh, and we will hear this from Joseph Tegada, who is a senior officer with that organization. Thank you all for being with us uh, on this panel, and I'll have uh, the pleasure to give the floor now to Scott Rembrandt. Please, Scott. Well, thank you very much, Daniel, and so on behalf of the uh, at the 17 different agencies in the United States that focus on combating illicit uh, wildlife trade and uh, belatedly uh, money laundering proceeds generated by the, those crimes. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak uh, on our behalf. I wanted to first congratulate the FATF, the, the co-leads of the project, project team on a very successful report and we're very encouraged that uh, over 50 countries contributed to the the report itself. In addition, I want to thank China for putting this uh, at the top of their agenda uh, during the presidency, given the importance of the issue, and also recognize the importance of uh, the German president's uh, prioritization of environmental crimes as a future project. I think the report did an excellent job of talking about uh, how the FATF standards, the existing standards, can be used as a framework to address wildlife uh, trafficking threats by strengthening national laws and policies, improving domestic coordination, international cooperation, and facilitating partnerships with the private sector. And we, we think it'll be a very vital tool for governments to adopt uh, best practices against this very harmful crime. Speaking from the, the US perspective, uh, we are both a, a source and destination country for illegal wildlife trade. And I wanted to offer the US perspective on uh, what we're doing to address uh, the, this pernicious crime. Given our risk exposure, the U.S. has been actively involved in, in combating wildlife trafficking and takes a whole of government approach uh, under the auspices of something that's called the Presidential Task Force on Wildlife Trafficking, which the Treasury Department is a part. Probably the leaders from the U.S. government perspective in terms of addressing uh, 
illegal wildlife trafficking, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Department of Justice, Department of State, and the U.S. Agency for International Development are some of the leaders among the 17 part or 17 interagency effort. Um, just taking sort of the some of the findings of the, the FATF report, I, I wanted to talk briefly about what the U.S does first to lay out what our operational framework is, then talk about capacity building, then touch upon investigations, and finally public-private partnerships. In terms of ensuring we have the right framework to address uh, money laundering as relates to uh, the illegal wildlife trade, something called the END Act, that's an acronym, it's a very long act, which I name, which I won't spend time on, but it allows the U.S. to apply provisions or criminal code concerning money laundering for wildlife trafficking violations of a whole host of acts related to the illicit wildlife trade. So that, that allows us from an operational perspective to, to utilize our uh, existing statute. We've also been very active as relates to capacity building and international cooperation. Each year, the United States spends uh, upwards of $100 million to fund counter wildlife trafficking programs around the world. The, the State Department uh, chairs something called the Interagency Conservation Crime Committee uh, that helps select some of these capacity building projects. And we also provide foreign assistance to combat corruption and uh, illicit and illegal wildlife trade. The U.S. has helped train over 5,000 personnel in 40 countries to improve our law enforcement partners' capacity and investigate, prosecute uh, illegal wildlife trade. And our Fish and Wildlife Service also um, provides strong investigative support to law enforcement around the world. And they have 11 attaches uh, in different embassies um, outside the United States. In terms of the in investigatory pers perspective, the US, I think we contributed eight case studies to the, the recently published report. And one of the most prominent ones is called Operation Crash, where uh, led by our Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Justice. Uh, it included, it includes rather, over 100 different law enforcement agents and it's led to over a dozen convictions primarily related to illegal ivory and rhino horn trade. And uh, in addition, there's additional cases pending and the charges filed Against defendants range from conspiracy to smuggling to money laundering to mail fraud to tax evasion and show the variety of tools that governments can use to go after criminal activity associated with wildlife trafficking. And finally, I wanted to note information, uh, the importance of information sharing. The, the U.S. is one of the first countries in the world to allow information sharing uh, from the government uh, of financial intelligence and also between financial institutions and give it uh, some uh, degrees of legal protection to allow financial institutions to do that. We have something called three, Section 314B of the USA Patriot Act, which allows um, financial institutions to share information related to a suspected money laundering or terrorist financing. And this is something that financial institutions here can avail themselves on. And picking up on, uh, the importance of public-private partnership. Uh, we, from our office and others in the U.S. government, are very active in encouraging outreach to different parts of uh, industry in the United States, not just financial institutions, but also designated non-financial businesses and professions, particularly dealers in precious metals, stones, and jewels. And we found these partnerships and information sharing to be very important and a good way to uh, share uh, typologies and red flag indicators and other issues of concern. So those are some of the things that we're working on and the extent time allows, I'm happy to answer any questions and the extent it doesn't, uh, people are welcome to contact me. My, my email is my name at treasury.gov. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Scott, for, for um, your intervention, the sharing and uh, the good news of ongoing commitment of the U.S. government to tackle um, money laundering associated to, to RWT. Um, thanks for the, the submissions you have made. The, the case studies are really important uh, to form a collective uh, view, uh, a global view also on, on the issue for, for the FATF report. Um, and I think it's very, it's a good example the, the U.S. is 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 setting here by by forming this interagency cooperation mechanism. I call it task force, call it coordinative committee. But I think 
um, uh, this is this is probably the right approach to take uh, to include uh, not only the government agencies that deal with money laundering they probably know each other and, 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 and collaborate with each other regularly but also reach out to uh, agencies that deal with conservation with, with um, uh, protection of, uh, of wildlife etc that are usually probably not part of the of the existing um, interagency coordination frameworks thanks a lot thanks a lot for that um, now again, um, UNODC, Melissa Tollis, I think the uh, presence of uh, you and your colleague here shows the important role UNODC is, is playing in money laundering in general, um, uh, but also in particular with regard to uh, illegal wildlife trade. Please, uh, Melissa, the floor is yours. I can't hear you. You may have switched. I think you have to unmute your microphone. Thank That's you. perfect. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you to FATAC, the Secretariat, um, to the former president, uh, Zhang Min Yu, for his leadership in including money laundering and the illegal wildlife trade in his president's priorities. I'd also like to thank the project's co-leads and congratulate them on an excellent and very, very important piece of work. Um, the timing of this is fortuitous, actually. On the 10th of uh, July, UNODC launched its World Wildlife Crime Report 2020. Um, that report emphasizes the threat that wildlife trafficking poses to nature and to the biodiversity of the planet. And as you will have heard from Fabrizio in session two, UNODC provides practical support to UN member states in their efforts to detect and disrupt money laundering related to the illegal wildlife trade and associated offenses, including corruption. Member states' commitments to implement the FATF recommendations and the provisions of the UNTOC and the UNCAC are foundational to these efforts. As all the panelists have stated today thus far, it is absolutely fundamental to focus on the financial side of wildlife crime. The report demonstrates in detail that implementing robust anti-money laundering frameworks and focusing on money laundering risk and the proceeds of crime have an enormous potential to increase detection and prosecutions globally, and yet the financial side is still overlooked. The cases provided in the report, including the cold cases that Fabrizio mentioned, however, show that following the money through effective financial investigations and international cooperation focused on the proceeds of crime and payments are vital to protecting this globe's fragile biodiversity. We've taken careful note of the report's proposed actions to strengthen the global response to money laundering from the illegal wildlife trade, and we endorse all of them. UNODC will continue to assist member states in strengthening their capacity to combat money laundering and disrupt money laundering networks, as well as to improve the effectiveness of financial investigations and the use of financial intelligence. In that context, we appreciate the practical and technical recommendations of the report, um, that are on pages 57 to 59. Um, we've spoken a lot about cooperation, public-private partnerships, and international cooperation, and we do think it's vital that countries understand the full range of cooperation mechanisms, some of which were mentioned in our panelist discussions, and to make full use of multi-stakeholder partnerships, including civil society and the private sector to improve domestic and international cooperation. FATF president priorities give us a forum to focus on vital global money laundering priorities. We welcome the project of environmental crime, the priority of the current FATF president, Marcus Clyer, who just spoke, go hand in hand. Environmental sustainability is a necessary condition for peace and development. It is a determinant of sustainable development and it runs through all of the sustainable development goals under the 2030 agenda. Combating money laundering related to environmental crime is also necessary for member states' efforts to reliably mobilize domestic resources for sustainable, inclusive growth, which are more important than ever now. In this context, therefore, UNODC will give its full support to the current FATF president's priority of preventing and disrupting money laundering related to environmental crime. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, I think we, we lost your video uh, towards the end, but we heard uh, uh, very gladly your uh, commitment, you know, the FIS commitment to continue work on money laundering related to, to IWT and working with member countries to tackle the issue, which is uh, very welcome, uh, extremely relevant. Thanks also for your uh, support on, on the content of the um, FATF uh, work. And indeed, um, we should not forget that this is all linked to the sustainable development goals of, of the UN to which all member countries have committed to implement by, by 2030. Uh, thanks a lot, Melissa. Um, I have the pleasure to move on to, to David Fine, as mentioned, Group uh, General Council of Standards Charter. Please, David. Thank you, Daniel. Delighted to be here and to support the work that FATF has done on uh, fighting illegal wildlife trafficking. On behalf of the Royal Foundation, United for Wildlife, led by His Royal Highness Prince William and Chair uh, Lord William Hague, uh, who formed the two task forces. Um, first, the Transport Task Force, about five years ago, made up of um, now more than a hundred leading transport companies across the globe. And then more recently, uh, less than two years ago, formed the Financial Task Force, now consisting of almost 40 global financial institutions, um, again across the globe, all united uh, for wildlife to fight illegal wildlife trafficking. We see the FATF report on money laundering and IWT as a really profound event in the fight against IWT. And we're delighted to support, to have supported that, that report and to continue to support it um, now that it's been published. Um, what we'd like to do today, what I'd like to do today is just mention three ways in which um, we're taking some of these steps forward and with our members and with partners and with others. And so if I could just talk about three, three ways. The first is, for our almost 200 members of the task forces. Um, one of our goals is to assist them in embedding counter IWT measures into their training systems and processes. Uh, there are many ways we do that, lots of training programs, uh, training materials, uh, often just sharing from member to member best practices, but also we have wonderful partners in the task forces, consulting firms, educators, NGOs, and sharing that information across our membership. Um, but one particular tool that we're developing that I wanted to call out because it coincided so well with the FATF report is the development of an IWT risk assessment template for our members, especially our financial institution members. Um, you'll see in the report, and I'll just quote briefly, while source countries for illegal wildlife are beginning to carry out relevant money laundering risk assessments, this is rarely the case for other countries. Even countries without significant wildlife resources should consider whether criminals may be using their financial or non-financial systems to launder proceeds from IWT. Transit destination and third countries should consider assessing such risks. But we agree with that from a sovereign perspective, but we also agree with it from a member private sector perspective. And so our initiative is to create an IWT risk assessment template to be used by our members to enable them to assess their inherent risk exposure to IWT based on a series of factors, jurisdiction, products, transaction flows, business types. Um, and so that's a tool that we're, we're um, developing and I think it, it supports very well and, uh, with the FATF report suggestion that countries um, build a risk assess assessment around IWT. Secondly, um, one of our themes has been um, a, a focus in region uh, and something that I think the report also stresses the importance of looking at IWT and how to respond from a regional lens. We think um, it's important to build localized networks in key regions where our members can design, share, and support regionally appropriate and specific responses to IWT in light of the unique threat picture and resources available in that region. And that includes our members, our partners, and all interested parties. Um, the report notes the work we've been doing in this regard at United for Wildlife, 
uh, last fall and in this winter prior to the pandemic when we convened IWT financial workshops in key regions, including China, East Africa, and Southern Africa. And we brought together financial institutions, our members and would-be members, transport companies, government agencies, NGOs, and others to raise awareness of IWT and the role that we can play to help disrupt, to, to help disrupt detect, and prevent IWT. Uh, our colleagues, colleagues from the FATF participated in all of those events and we're very uh, appreciative of their spending their time helping to educate um, the, our members and other interested people. Well, our next step is to create regional chapters so that the work continues um, in regions and can carry out the, some of the uh, mandates from the FATF report. And third, um, we're going to continue to call for greater focus and prioritization across the ecosystem to combat IWT, something else um, that the report talks about. Using our platform, we are asking for an effective end-to-end -end chain review whereby the public sector is prepared and intentioned to receive and act on information that our members report. One way we think uh, that's most important in that regard, Scott Rembrandt from the um, from U.S. Treasury reference, is through public-private partnerships. And you'll see a reference to that in the FATF report, and indeed to the use of the Section 314B information sharing that Scott talked about. Um, indeed, our members um, did that work on IWT earlier this year in support of U.S. Fish and Wildlife investigations. And, and we think the use of public-private partnerships around the globe to enhance um, the IWT financial investigations is really important. We hope other PPPs around the globe, uh, in the UK, in the form of Jimlet, in Australia with the Fintel Alliance, in the Netherlands, uh, and even now a newer PPP in South Africa called Samlet. We think these are great um, vehicles for uh, enhancing the effort and prioritizing the effort against illegal wildlife trafficking. Um, I'd like to conclude with a just brief message from uh, Prince William, who recorded this message recently for our nearly 200 members across our task forces. And um, I think especially in light of the, uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, it's an especially timely and pertinent message. The COVID-19 pandemic has ruined lives and threaten livelihoods across the world. No country is immune. Sadly, the conservation sector is suffering too. Crucial tourism revenue has largely dried up and it will be many months, perhaps even years, before it recovers. Rangers' salaries are at risk and there are early indications that economic hardship may be leading more people to turn back to poaching. Yet, as we continue to face up to the ongoing shocks of this crisis, there is a notable opportunity for those of us committed to ending the illegal wildlife trade. Never before have the public health risks of the wildlife trade come into such sharp focus. Never before has there been greater public awareness about the dangers of zoonotic diseases like Ebola, SARS, MERS and COVID. And never before has the global incentive to act been so high. Right now, there is a real chance to ensure that the urgent steps that the world must take to prevent future zoonotic disease pandemics are designed in a way that also helps to eradicate the illegal wildlife trade. This will require concerted effort and teamwork from international organizations, governments, law enforcement, the NGO community and the private sector. United for Wildlife and all of you as task force members have a crucial role to play. Just to uh, emphasize the message from that, which is as, as countries consider how to implement um, and measures they're going to take, consistent with the FATF report, you can know that um, United for Wildlife and all of our members are there to support that effort uh, across the, the entire chain and um, you can count on us.
Thank you, Daniel. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, David. Um, another food for thought, I believe. Um, and this is certainly not the last time we have spoken about this. Um, particularly interesting also what you said about the risk assessment. This is all about properly assessing the risk. And indeed, as you said, both on the on the private sector side as well as on as on the public side, things have started, but we have to go much much broader, including in countries where this is maybe not perceived to be a major risk, which is probably probably wrong. But also highlighting again, like Scott did, um, uh, 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 on the in importance of public-private partnerships. Now, I'm curious to see if other PPPs would indeed um, do additional work on that. That would be that would certainly be great. Thanks a lot. So now um, moving on to to Joseph Chigada from uh, the Eastern and Southern Africa Anti-Money Laundering Group, SMLAC. Please, Joseph, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Daniel, and um, good afternoon or morning or evening to everyone. Um, I would like uh, to first thank the FATF and the Chinese presidency for carrying out this project, which is very important uh, to SMLAG. And um, we, in SMLAG, we had also done a, a project earlier, which looked at some of the issues which uh, were looked at uh, uh, under this project. And um, we are happy that um, uh, SMLAG has been taking, SMLAG member countries have been taking um, action to try and fight IWT. And um, uh, with uh, those efforts, I, I think they will uh, be complemented um, uh, um, with uh, uh, the findings of uh, the report uh, uh, by the FATF um, uh, on IWT. Um, the my presentation is going to simply look at um, uh, three uh, areas uh, briefly uh, one is the actions being taken in the samlag uh, to fight uh, awt and man related money laundering and secondly just look at um, a, an overview of challenges that uh, we have seen and thirdly the uh, next steps that are being taken uh, are, are planned uh, uh, in SAMLAC uh, based on the recommended actions coming out of um, uh, the IWT report. So when we look at um, what has been happening uh, in SAMLAC to try and fight IWT, we have seen um, a, a lot of member countries now coming up with um, task forces or teams uh, to ensure that um, um, nearly all the relevant stakeholders um, are involved um, in investigating and even prosecution of IWT crimes. I think in some countries this has given uh, good success. Uh, the best example would be in Tanzania where they had to form such a task force to investigate activities of a Chinese lady called the Ivory Queen. And uh, eventually that case was properly investigated, prosecuted, and um, the syndicate was uh, 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 convicted. And uh, then also we have seen efforts uh, by member countries in forming what are uh, called uh, uh, community projects uh, to assist uh, poor communities living close to either national parks, national conservatives, or game parks, so that um, they can actually earn some income out of uh, the wildlife uh, resources which they have. And this has discouraged them from actually supporting activities related to IWT. So I think this has helped a lot because it reduces poaching and then other illegal activities uh, 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 surrounding uh, IWT. And um, also there are efforts now to also engage with the private sector uh, in terms of trying to increase the rate of uh, identification of suspicious transactions uh, uh, through uh, training and wider engagements uh, to build awareness. So um, some of this training had started already, but I think with the outbreak of COVID-19, um, these activities have sort of uh, slowed down, and we hope um, 
one, once um, there is improvement in the COVID situation, uh, the training uh, will resume. Uh, then also, we of late we have our FIU heads of analysis who are getting together to try and come up with a platform to exchange information uh, amongst the FIUs in the region. And um, this, in our view, will enhance uh, the speed at which uh, uh, the in, uh, information uh, is uh, shared and also uh, the security of that information um, as well as uh, the speed with which uh, it will be shared. And we think this is a very good initiative. Uh, it uh, uh, comes out uh, properly to work. Um, then also, um, with um, some of the cases which have been uh, 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 prosecuted in the region, we have seen, um, like in one of the cases, which is part of the uh, IWT report involving a syndicate in Malawi, uh, the Lin, the Lin Yonu uh, syndicate, uh, where uh, now the, the case has come to an end, and members of this syndicate um, have been sentenced um, and um, they've been the encouraging parties that they've been given varying imprisonment terms uh, uh, ranging from um, three years to 11 years. And we think this is a very good message uh, to uh, uh, like the uh, minded uh, people or criminals because it sends, uh, uh, it carries a deterring uh, message uh, for those who practice such activities. And also, I think of importance, we have seen uh, uh, pronouncements from some of the member countries on uh, uh, corruption, uh, which we think is a great influence on I I w I IWT crimes. Why when uh, criminals have to secure a safe passage of the products and also have to have uh, protected uh, safe houses for storage. And a lot of uh, corruption comes in with that. So I think with uh, the promotion or, or the fight of corruption, of corruption by most governments, this will also have um, a good end in supporting um, uh, IWT. However, having said that, we have also seen a few challenges uh, which we think uh, which we think um, can be uh, addressed. Um, um, uh, these mostly are to do with the uh, legal uh, frameworks of some of the countries which are the consuming countries where we think um, the criminalization of some of the offenses is not really uh, as, uh, uh, to the level that is expected and that poses a challenge uh, to some of these uh, uh, IW3 uh, activities that um, uh, the region is trying to combat. And also, uh, we think there should be more strengthening of uh, confiscation regimes uh, in, in our member countries so that the illicit proceeds which are generated from IWT can easily be identified uh, as well as traced and uh, confiscated. So, and also what is important, perhaps there's also a possibility of sharing these proceeds with some of the affected countries, which don't have adequate resources to actually um, trace and identify some of these activities. So that would be a good source of uh, resources for them. We are also trying to uh, uh, build uh, awareness uh, for private, uh, for the private sector, which we have seen that in most cases, they either wittingly or unwittingly support transaction partner financing, um, IWT. Um, just um, a few um, uh, proposals that we are looking at in order to ensure that there's effective implementation of the recommended actions coming out of um, the IWT report. As AMLAG intends to come up or is already discussing developing a two-year implementation plan uh, uh, on the, of the recommendations um, and um, mostly this plan will uh, encourage member countries to actually identify the high risk areas relating to IWT and come up with uh, uh, adequate measures to mitigate these areas or to ensure that uh, 
uh, there is a, a proper prioritization of uh, the implementation of some of the recommendations which have come out of the report. And also, we are also trying to encourage or to see that the plan um, encourages risk profiling uh, in, uh, in member countries. And this uh, will be also evaluated or be, become a, an important component of, this, of the member countries during their assessments and also during review of their follow-up process so that mm -hmm. um, they implement some of these recommendations in addressing uh, their deficiencies or weaknesses which have been picked um, in the, uh, with their IWT. And uh, finally, we are also uh, uh, looking at ways of uh, encouraging um, uh, various um, uh, means of uh, financial investigations uh, include, including parallel financial investigations and also the other components which come with the investigations of IWT and related money laundering, including international cooperation as well as capacity building. So uh, as well as also more engagement with the private sector mm -hmm. and the NPO sector, because we believe they have got a huge uh, role to play in IWT uh, activities or in, in the fight against IWT activities and uh, related money laundering. Uh, okay. th thank you. Thanks a lot, Daniel. I think that was my bit. Um, if there are any questions, then I can attend to them later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph. Um, not only informing us about the, the important work that ESMLAG is doing. I mean, ESMLAG, along with uh, the Asia Pacific Group, has been one of the trailblazers in, on, on that topic, uh, but also um, um, highlighting the importance of confiscation. Um, this crime still pays, and that's a shame. Um, despite efforts to start with investigations, we have not yet come to the point where we can say that we are effectively freezing, seizing, and confiscating proceeds of illegal wildlife trade. And that's, that's a shame, and that's certainly the, the main reason why we should all commit to, to do more. But I can see a lot of happening in in the area you are covering, and these are very, very encouraging first, uh, first signals. Thank you for, for your contribution to, um, I um, would like now to invite um, three other uh, short interveners to, to share um, the very practical um, uh, um, uh, uh, views on how to, to implement the recommendations of the report. And I will start with um, Indonesia, please. Uh, Indonesia, the floor is yours. I think we have a little audio problem. Indonesia, can you try again, please? I, I think we, we can't hear you. But what I do, I will start with the other two interveners, and so maybe you can try to turn off and then turn on your micro, and then I will give you back the floor, okay? Hello, Dean. Uh, yeah, Hello. now this is much better. Yes, Indonesia, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, thanks also for Chinese presidency for having this project priority and continued by German presidency through its environmental prime project. In this opportunity, I would like to appreciate work of college in PPAT care or FIU Indonesia, as well as law enforcement agency to combat IWT. Also, I have secretariat to arrange this wonderful webinar. Uh, Indonesia remains committed to tackling IWT and environmental crimes. Also, the commitment of Indonesia through its FIU to pursuing IWT by conducting financial analysis and joint analysis. Countries should identify and assess their ML risk relating to IWT by involving relevant experts and data in the risk assessment process and should in pl put in place mitigation me mechanism and allocate resources in line with any identified ML risks. Indonesian FIU did assessment on MLTF risk of IWT in 2015 and updating in 2020. Indonesia sees the report on IWT as a call to action for all countries or jurisdictions to do more and encourage all countries to follow the recommendation of the report. Countries should consider how they can increase cooperation with foreign countries to strengthen measures 
to identify and combat money laundering from IWT. Indonesian, Thailand, and Cambodian EVAYU have started to identify threats of money laundering or, ter or terrorist financing from IWT in Southeast Asia Plus region under Financial Intelligence Consultative Group project. The result or output of the project is to publish the IWT threat assessment, which will be published in 2021. A brief information regarding the threat assessment, it will be four sections that consist of measuring threat on IWT, including statistics and perceptions. Second one is country capabilities. The third one, the list of red flags indicators, and the last case studies. Indonesian EVAYU was also involved in EVAYU joint analysis related to IWT with AUSTREC or Australian EVAYU regarding rep reptile trafficking. Indonesian EVAYU also actively share financial intelligence with other countries related to transnational IWT. As the next steps, Indonesia will have further communication or meeting with EVAYU China to follow up IWT case related with Indonesia and China. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rodi. Very encouraging to hear from, from your plans, and we were looking very much forward to hearing more about the, the results of your important activity. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the um, China already, so this is um, a chance for me to uh, give the floor to the third co-lead of the FATF report. Uh, glad to have you here, Jiang. Uh, the floor is yours, please. I can't hear you, Xiang. Um, can you please try again, maybe to mute and unmute, unmute and mute your microphone? I try it again, please. Now it's muted. If you can unmute. I'm afraid I, I, I still can't hear you. Um, so if you don't mind, um, We'll put you on hold for a second and we'll move on to the UK for another announcement and then we'll try again. Is that okay? Uh, I can see nodding. Okay, perfect. Martin um, from the UK side, please. Sure, thank you, Daniel. Um, I just wanted to uh, announce now that the UK is looking to, over the coming months, to establish a new bilateral technical assistance unit um, that will be housed within uh, my agency, which is uh, HM Treasury. Um, and this unit will seek to support partner countries to implement the FATF standards and to tackle financial crime. Uh, one specific focus of it will be to support partner law enforcement agencies um, to more regularly and more successfully conduct financial investigations into high risk predicate offences. Now, in certain countries where IWT falls within that category, then this unit will um, definitely be supporting or looking to support um, those partner countries to implement the findings of this FATF report. The, the capability is in the process of being uh, stood up and, and we look forward to working with those, um, with our partners as and when it is ready. Thank you. Thanks a lot, um, Martin, for sharing this. This is, uh, this is fantastic news. Uh, congratulations on, on these efforts. Um, so let me try again uh, with China. Jiang, can you hear me? I can see you, but very unfortunately, I can't hear you. Um, so let us see, let us move on with the Q&A session. We still have a few minutes left and I will try again. Sorry for that. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I still, can't, I still can't hear you and I think, um, I think it's not only me. Um, we are running a little bit late. Uh, we have already reached, so um, for those of you who cannot stay longer, I would already like to thank you for your participation, but I would like to add 10 minutes if you appreciate time. Uh, I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, uh, because we had a number of very good questions coming up. Now, unfortunately, we cannot answer um, all of them, uh, but I encourage the panelists also to give direct answers in the Q&A uh, functionality of this tool. Um, but I would like to start with one question and actually several questions, several uh, participants have come up with um, 
with the same issue. And these were questions around a, a potential nexus between corruption and IWT. And I know the FDF report has looked into this. Um, I don't know, Martin, if you if you could maybe share with us a bit the views you have. Is there is there a link between corruption and IWT? Have you seen cases that would um, sustain this this finding? Thank you, Daniel, and, and absolutely. Um, it certainly wouldn't be a novel conclusion for this FATF report to say that there is a link between corruption and, and IWT. Um, I think that's been well established in the existing literature on, on the topic. Um, and, and to make this very clear, I think that's because uh, the illegal wildlife trade obviously involves criminality occurring across multiple jurisdictions with multiple actors. Um, and, and one of those um, forms of criminality is obviously corruption. Um, corruption happening in source, transit, and indeed in destination countries as well. Um, obviously, for an IWT uh, kind of supply chain to continue to work sustainably, then it needs to, those, those who are controlling a syndicate need to be able to rely on um, corrupt officials, um, such as say those working in game management or environmental agencies or forestry agencies in source countries or corrupt officials working in customs or border controls in transit and destination countries in order to reliably source um, wildlife, uh, protected wildlife illegally and then to move it through to the endpoint to their customers in their destination country. So there, there certainly is a link um, and and uh, if um, and if FIUs and other financial crime um, focused law enforcement agencies are going to tackle um, the illegal wildlife trade, then then tackling corruption is a big part of that. But if we look at if we look at how this has been covered in the FATF report, there is a specific example. I think it's Box Seven, which talks about a syndicate that was led um, by a former police officer. Um, and, uh, and that specific case involved the bribery of a, a, a parks official. So it's, it's well captured in the report and it's something that um, has been drawn out there. I think it's also, if you look at the, um, just to quickly wrap this up, if you look at the red flags at the end, it talks about the need for, um, to pay attention to the risks that certain officials working in those exposed sectors may pose. But thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Martin. I hope this did um, answer the questions that came up in, in that regard. Um, another question I found particularly interesting from Arun was um, referring to the to the role um, social media platforms have. Uh, how do we actually ensure a buy-in from social media companies to tackle IWT? I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Nick, but um, I wonder, have you considered this already in your work that traffic is doing? Yeah, certainly. And especially now under the, the existing economic climate, there is, we are seeing uh, shifts to, to more online or, or mobile based platforms too, just for the sale and transactions of, of illicit proceeds. So we, we have been uh, working in this space ourselves, along with other partners, have been working with internet-based companies, social media companies um, all over the world, actually, to help them through an online uh, wildlife uh, crime coalition, um, which you can get more information on our website or you can email me um, and I can share with you. Uh, but it's a, it's a great coalition of, of online partners, um, all the ones that you can think of pretty much um that are actively looking at improving their own internal analytics to help uh, identify um, illegal products being sold on their platforms but also to help consumers make better choices about what is and what isn't illegal um, and then also using the the platforms that have associated uh, mechanisms for movement of money as many of them do um, getting them engaged as well so there are efforts and it's certainly um an er an area that can grow much more in, in, in what's being done. But um, yeah, I'm happy to, to answer any more questions after um, about our work in that space. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Nick, uh, Nick for that. I think given the role social media companies have in, in all areas we're covering, this is something, an opportunity we, we should not miss. Um, our last question, I already apologize for not being able to 
to uh, respond to all questions that came up, but, but there were so many. But when, um, when you say, uh, you know, that question was referring to a statement in the report that may have come a bit as a surprise to some of you, is the, the statement that um, we, we didn't discover professional money laundering or, or third party money laundering. Uh, rather a, a, a statement saying it's usually the criminal associations themselves would also deal with the money laundering part. This was somewhat questioned and I would um, maybe again invite Martin, um, you've been working on that very um, very deeply. Uh, what make you come to that conclusion? And do you think that maybe this is maybe changing over time? Thanks Daniel and, and thank you to, I think it was uh, Richard Gould who raised it. Um, it's, a, it's a very good question and, and we of course um, when writing the report, um, recognised that, um, that the findings in it are, of course, limited by the information that we received from the, uh, the over 50 countries that, um, or around 50 different jurisdictions, rather, that contributed to the report. Um, we, uh, I think, would, would like to be able to say that we have guarded against kind of confirmation bias here and, and recognised that, you know, it may be the case that it is happening. However, the cases that we received for the study did not indicate that um, professional money laundering networks or, or third party launderers were indeed involved. Now, what we do hope would happen um, is that we would be able to answer that, um, we'd be able to test that conclusion in future and answer perhaps even more authoritatively in future. Um, but of course, to do that would require that um, all relevant agencies, um, including FIUs and others who look into the financial aspects of, of such crimes, um, they will need to increase their focus on IWT as a proceeds generating crimes uh, and follow those leads to, to, um, to uncover those perhaps more sophisticated money laundering methods. If that doesn't happen, then it seems likely that um, the, the less sophisticated methods will be the ones that are continue to um, be successfully tackled and, and, you know, and put forward in reports such as this. So, the challenge, I guess, is, is back to countries to help us answer that question again. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, now, we really only have two minutes left. I'll try again uh, with our line to China. I hope the technical box has been fixed in the meantime. Jiang, uh, can you hear me? And do you want to try one more time to make your intervention? Well, I'm afraid it seems to be an ongoing problem. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for that, but I'm sure we will have the opportunity to hear more on, um, uh, on, on China's future efforts and continued efforts in, in that regard. Um, okay, um, as an outgoing chair, I may have the liberty to, to, to um, add a, a personal comment on the last topic that raised the, the absence of professional uh, money launderers. It could also be a signal that we have not been good enough to tackle money laundering and the, from, from the illegal wildlife trade. It could be a signal that we made it pretty easy for the criminals to make money. Uh, so why should I engage and pay for professional money launderers if um, I'm not detected, if I don't uh, face a consequence from my wrongdoing? And this should be, if that's right, this would be very worrying. And, um, uh, I think this should give us uh, enough justification to pursue the issue far more seriously. Uh, the FATF report, the work of the, um, of the coalition private sector, uh, the work of NGOs have all shown that it is possible to achieve results, but we have to become better to tackle um, the consequences of illegal wildlife trade and uh, conducting financial in investigation using the money laundering toolbox to tackle these is certainly uh, a very meaningful um, instrument. Um, I'm very optimistic that this will happen, that we will succeed. Um, uh, also because the FATF will continue to work on environmental crimes, including IWT. Uh, also what we heard from the UN, uh, who is supporting this president's agenda on, on environmental crime. And I'm very uh, positive uh, because of you, um, uh, participants to this webinar, as well as all the speakers and panelists. And I would like to invite all panelists to, to turn on your cameras just for, a, um, I'll say you personally, many thanks for your contribution to the report, for your participation in this webinar, 
for your ongoing commitment uh, in all levels. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing more uh, on this subject matter uh, and to hear more um, success stories. I would like very warmly uh, thank the Secretariat. Uh, you, you can see them on the screen now. There have been a lot of uh, hands and faces to, to work on, on making this happen. This is also relatively new for us, the webinars, but I think it's another example how we can, uh, the crisis, the pandemic crisis is not a uh, reason not to conduct work. It can never be an excuse to stop working on these issues. Many, many thanks for all of you who have been involved in that. Good continuation of your work. Uh, have a good afternoon or evening for our colleagues in uh, Australia and Asia and a good uh, continuation uh, of your day. But thank you very much and uh, goodbye.